Hello, this is Mike, and welcome to another episode of Urban Legends and Conspiracies, the show where we discuss your favorite folklores, histories, and all the fun things in life that we love to talk about. On this episode, we are discussing the infamous El Dorado. Where is it? How did it become lost? And will we ever find it? Well, like always, let's start at the beginning. So when we think of El Dorado, the first thing we think of is a mythical Native American lost city of gold. And it would make sense why we think that. I mean, that's the story, right? There's this mythical lost city of gold that's out there in the Amazon rainforest that many conquistadors searched for and many others searched for including the likes of Sir Walter Raleigh. However, it always eluded them and it still eludes us to this day. This great golden city which is just sitting there just waiting for some wayward traveler or treasure hunter to stumble upon and make the greatest archaeological discovery in the last hundred years. So it has to exist, right? Well, no actually. When you actually look at the word El Dorado itself it does not translate to golden city it translates to the golden one and it refers to a mythical tribal king of the musica people who were an indigenous people of colombia who as an initiation rite actually covered himself in gold dust and submerged himself in lake guatavita thank you spanish the legend surrounding el dorado eventually changes over time it becomes more embellished and becomes the legend of the city of gold as as it went from being about a man to a city to a kingdom and then finally an empire and it's really the story about how this legend evolved which is actually more fascinating than the actual legend itself so what is the original legend and how did it evolve over time and why did it lead countless Spanish explorers to wander off into the Amazon some to never be seen again so let's start with where the legend begins with the Muisca people of Colombia and yes I do know that I did miss pronounce it earlier. I'm not going to edit it. I own up to my mistakes. So the Muisca people lived in what is now modern day Colombia at around the same time as the Aztec, Maya, and Inca civilizations. And before we discount them as being one of these kind of backwards tribal people, the Muisca confederation was just as advanced as their contemporaries, the Aztecs, the Mayas, the Incas. They're just lesser known, probably because their conquests didn't have the same powerful storytelling as the conquests of the Aztecs or the conquests of the Incas. So in the mythology of the Muisca, Mina, the golden color, represented the energy contained in the trinity of Chiminigaga. I know I said that wrong. Which constitutes the creative power of everything that exists. So with this religious significance placed on gold, it's no surprise that it played a large role in a lot of their ceremonial rituals and activities which brings us to a very important ceremony in their culture which would later become known as El Hombre Dorado or the Golden Man or El Rey Dorado the Golden King. So this ritual takes place on Lake Gutavita near present-day Bogota and what goes on in this ritual kind of becomes the foundation of this myth and we actually have accounts of this ceremony one which I'll read from now from 1638 written by Juan Rodriguez Friel. I love Spanish. So in 1638, Friel writes this account of the ceremony, quote, The ceremony took place on the appointment of a new ruler before taking office. He spent some time in a secluded cave without women, forbidden to eat salt or to go out during daylight. The first journey he had to make was to go to the great lagoon of Guatavita to make offerings and sacrifices to the demon which they worshipped as their god and lord. During the ceremony, which took place at a lagoon, they made a raft of rushes, embellishing and decorating it with the most attractive things they had. They put it on four lighted braziers in which they burned some moke, which is the incense of these natives, and also resin and many other perfumes. The lagoon was large and deep, so that a ship with high sides could sail on it, all loaded with an infinity of men and women dressed in fine plumes, golden plaques, and crowns. As soon as those on the raft began to burn incense, they also lit the razors on the shore so that the smoke hid the light of day. At this time they stripped the air to his skin and anointed him with a sticky earth on which they placed gold dust so that he was completely covered in this metal. They placed him on the raft and at his feet they placed a great heap of golden emeralds for him to offer to his god. In the raft with him went four principal subject chiefs decked in plumes, crowns, bracelets, pendants, and earrings all of gold. They too were naked and each one carried his offering. When the raft 
reached the center of the lagoon, they raised a banner as a signal for silence. The gilded Indian then threw out all the pile of gold into the middle of the lake, and the chiefs who had accompanied him did the same on their own accounts. As they lowered the flag, which that remained up during the whole time of offering, and as the raft moved toward the shore, the shouting began again, with pipes, flutes, and large teams of singers and dancers. With this ceremony, the new ruler was received and recognized as Lord and King. This is the ceremony that became the famous El Dorado, which has taken so many lives and fortunes. End quote. So you can see, even by the time that this account was written, El Dorado was already a well-known myth that was going around, and it was already being exaggerated, for it was leading to these conquests and searches for it. And since 1938, it would have been in the middle of the time where this legend was sweeping across Europe and sweeping across the explorers who would come to conquer the lands and seek their fortunes. It could be that this account was actually the writer doing his own research into what was the source of this El Dorado, this myth, this fantasy. It seems like he may have been doing some debunking himself. And at this time, it would make sense why there would be a myth like this. As we see expeditions looking for cities of gold go back to the 1530s. It enticed these European explorers for two centuries. I mean, it wasn't until the 19th century when it was kind of discounted as just lore. And we have to remember that South America was a largely unexploited continent. Gold and precious resources were fairly plentiful, and they didn't play a role really in the economies of these people outside of a ceremonial purpose or decorative purpose. It was largely ignored. Europeans were the ones that really valued it as a commodity for wealth as long as well as silver and precious gems etc etc they built their economies around these metals that they could extract which is a very labor extensive process so if you just walk into a city and just pluck gold off the streets i mean there's an easy win you go home and you're a hero it might even make you a king so it's easy to see why the smith grew and why there were all of these expeditions to look for this lost city of gold. Which actually brings us to those expeditions. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on every single expedition. There are dozens of them. However, I will touch on a few. So even going back to the original conquest of the Aztec and Inca empires, the Spanish were already hearing rumors and tales of great cities with massive riches and it's really after the conquest of Peru by Francisco Pizarro when this idea became somewhat of a reality not really a reality but you know you find one kingdom full of riches and then you find another one the idea that that next one is just right around the corner is pretty tempting so it's really in 1531 when we see the earliest written reference of an El Dorado like kingdom and this was during the expedition of a man named Ordaz. He was a Spanish conquistador. He was a veteran of Cortez's campaign in Mexico. He did a lot of exploring in eastern Venezuela. He was one of the first to explore the Orinoco River and around this time in 1531 on an expedition for gold He wasn't actually looking for the city, he was looking for gold, resources, cinnamon, stuff like that. He was told of a kingdom called Meta. It was said to exist beyond a mountain on the left bank of the Orinoco River. It was supposedly abundant in gold and ruled by a chief that had one intact eye. So he follows the Orinoco River up to the mouth of the Meta. However, once he gets on the Meta River, he was blocked by rapids and forced to return. He would die shortly after in 1532 on his way back to Spain. Subsequent explorations would eventually go up the Meta River between 1532 and 1537. However, just like all other searches for El Dorado, they did come up high and dry and were forced to return. So the next real search we see for El Dorado comes from two German conquistadors. And yes, there were German conquistadors in and around South America. There were actually German Venezuelan land holdings between, I believe, 1528 up to about 1547. However, two German conquistadors, Nicholas Federman 
Lynn and Georg von Speyer. They searched the Venezuelan lowlands, the Columbia Plateaus, and the Orinoco Basin for El Dorado. However, like every other expedition that would come to follow, they would spend years wandering. They would be harassed by natives, weakened by hunger and fever, and will return back empty-handed. And both would die shortly after back in Germany. Which takes us to 1536 and the Quesada brothers' expeditions. So Gonzalo Jimenez de Quesada and his army of 800 men were on a mission in Peru to find an overland route to the Andean homeland of the Muisca for the first time. On the Bogota savanna, Quesada receives reports from captured natives about a kingdom called Metza, whose inhabitants built a temple dedicated to the sun and quote, keep in it an infinite quantity of gold and jewels and live in stone houses and go about dressed and booted and fight with lances and maces, end quote. So Quesada believed this to be the famed El Dorado and he actually decided to postpone his return to Spain for a year to search for it. Surprise, surprise, he never found it. He returns to Spain in May 1539. His brother later sets out to search for El Dorado in 1540 on a new expedition. Edition. He left with 270 Spanish soldiers and countless indigenous porters to explore, search, be harassed, fall to disease, all that fun stuff. And he was also, unsurprisingly, unsuccessful. He and his troops later returned to Santa Fe de Bogota. Now during this whole time, you have various conquistadors searching for gold. In 1537, that same conquistador, Gonzalo Jimenez de Quesada, actually discovers the source of this legend legend, he discovers Lake Guatavita. And obviously he must have known the story of this lake and the rituals associated with it because it's actually his brother in 1545, the Hernan Perez de Casada, along with the fellow condistador Lorazo Fonte, who decide to try to drain the lake with a bucket chain. So obviously they knew that there was gold down there from this ritual. However, their attempts weren't all that successful. They only pulled out about the equivalent of $100,000 today of gold. But this did lead to later attempts in 1580. An entrepreneur cut a notch into the rim to try to drain the lake. He only pulled out about 12,000 pesos worth of gold. There were other attempts. The last one was in 1898. It only pulled out about 500 pounds worth of gold. By 1965, the Colombian government designated it as a protected area. So further attempts to drain the lake or salvage anything is illegal. Now a lot of the Casada brothers had been at this lake and they knew of the myth, whether or not they knew that it pertained to the actual city of El Dorado, which had become a city in their minds at this point. Is anybody's guess? My guess would be no. I believe that they probably still believe that there was a city or a kingdom out there of gold, which is probably why these expeditions continued well into the 19th century. Now while subsequent expeditions would go on for almost 200 years, the last great hurrah of this golden age of the early conquistador expeditions would be with Sir Walter Raleigh. He led an expedition in 1595 and a second expedition in 1617 in Guyana in the area of the Orinoco River. They said that his finding of gold in the riverbanks only strengthened his resolve. However, these would also end in failure. Walter Raleigh would actually end up returning to England in 1618, where he would be beheaded for disobeying orders to avoid conflict with the Spanish. Now, truly after Sir Walter Raleigh's death is when we kind of see a downturn in these expeditions. And I think what's happening over these next 200 years is there's more focus on colonizing and resource extraction, so less focus is being put on finding these mythical lost cities of gold. While the rumor still remained, I think there was a less willingness of people to not only go on these missions, but I think there was less willingness to finance these expeditions. We have to remember that these aren't just like two guys out there on horseback with a few 
slaves or servants and or Native Americans or whatever. These are expeditions with hundreds of soldiers and thousands of porters who all need fed, clothed, these horses need watered. It's a huge financial endeavor and for that financial endeavor to end up failing, it's the equivalent today of opening up a business only to have it fail a year later after you've poured all this time and energy and money into it. And these people that would have normally financed this stuff, well they were finding real wealth in South America itself. There was a major silver strike in in modern Bolivia and it produced unprecedented wealth for the Spanish Empire. There were also subsequent gold strikes found in Brazil and Peru and all these other places. So it was more financially feasible to just extract this gold, send it back to Europe, rather than to continue searching for a city supposedly either made of gold or overflowing with the gold. However, it's kind of like winning the lottery. You hope that when you're walking out there in the forest one day, you just happen upon this great golden city with unprecedented wealth and riches. And I think that's really why the myth endured and continued going on even to this day. People dream of going to the Amazon and finding a lost city of gold and that's more enticing and desirable than actually trying to extract gold from a gold mine just stumbling upon it is easy if you can stumble upon it game over you're rich it's that inherent laziness in all humans i guess if we could find an easy way to be rich we wouldn't work for it i certainly wouldn't work for it if i found a way to make a million dollars tomorrow and that's what brings us to el dorado's final evolution as a metaphor it becomes used as a metaphor to represent that ultimate prize that holy grail a place where one could rapidly and easily acquire riches And not just monetary riches, it evolves to become that metaphor for representing the ultimate prize that one might spend their life seeking. It could represent love, happiness, success, whatever your heart's desire, that becomes your own personal El Dorado. However, the flip side of that is it becomes to be a figure of speech to represent something that you may spend your life searching for but never actually exists, which actually brings us to Edgar Allan Poe of all people. Now, what does the father of American Gothic horror have to do with the lost city of gold? Well, it's in 1849, during the California Gold Rush, when Poe writes a poem called El Dorado. And much like the subject of the poem, Poe himself was on a quest for success or happiness, and despite spending his life searching for it, he eventually loses his strength and faces death. And I would like to read from it now. While I read this, I like to think of the fury at the time during the California Gold Rush, that American search for El Dorado, when Americans were heading out west West in search of riches only to return penniless and broken. And I think of those Spanish conquistadors who went out on those expeditions thinking at first that they would find easy riches and glory only to return broken with nothing to show for their exp- for all the time and effort that they put in. Gaily Bedite, a gallant knight in sunshine and in shadow, had journeyed long singing a song in search of El Dorado. But he grew old this night so bold, and o'er his heart a shadow fell as he found no spot of ground that looked like El Dorado. And as his strength failed him at length, he met a pilgrim shadow. Shadow, said he, where can it be, this land of El Dorado? Over the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow, ride, boldly ride, the shade replied, if you seek El Dorado. Once again, this is Mike, and I thank you for listening. And as always, if you like what I'm doing, all I ask is that maybe you tell a friend about this uh, little podcast that I do. Um, This little project grows primarily by word of mouth, so any help on that front would be greatly appreciated. I do enjoy making these. I don't particularly make them for money or any other reason. It's just a fun hobby that I have. However, any kind of motivation, as in help, from the small community that is listening to this or maybe listening to this, it would motivate me to make a lot more of these in the future. And on that note, thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.